Chapter 1. The Strange Advertisement. My name is Jabez Wilson. I own a small pawnbroker shop in London. It is a modest business, but it keeps me busy. I have an assistant named Vincent Spaulding, a smart young man. He's very helpful, though he's always in the cellar developing photographs. One morning, as I was opening my shop, Vincent came to me with an excited look on his face. Mr. Wilson, he said, have you seen this advertisement in the newspaper? I took the paper from his hands and read it. The advertisement was strange. It said, To the red-headed league, there is a vacancy for a member of the league. Salary is four pounds a week. Apply in person Monday at eleven o'clock to Duncan Ross at Seven Popes Court, Fleet Street. I looked at Vincent, puzzled. What is this red-headed league? I asked. Vincent smiled. I don't know, Mr. Wilson, but it sounds like an opportunity. You have very red hair, and four pounds a week is a good salary for a few hours of work. You should apply. I was not convinced, but Vincent was persistent. You should try, Mr. Wilson. What do you have to lose? So, on Monday, I went to Seven Popes Court, Fleet Street. It was a narrow alley, and the building was old. I climbed the stairs and found a small office with a sign that said, The Red-Headed League. Inside, there were many men with red hair, all waiting. I joined the queue, feeling a bit foolish. After a while, a man with red hair called us in, one by one. When it was my turn, I entered the office and met Mr. Duncan Ross. Mr. Ross was a short man with red hair and a friendly smile. He asked me many questions about my background and my family. Then he looked closely at my hair. Congratulations, Mr. Wilson, he said. You are just the man we need. The job is yours. I was surprised. What is the job? I asked. Mr. Ross explained that the Red-Headed League was founded by an American millionaire, Ezekiah Hopkins, who had red hair. He wanted to help red-headed men like himself. The job was simple. I had to copy the Encyclopedia Britannica in longhand. I had to work from ten in the morning to two in the afternoon every day. But I could not leave the office during those hours. The salary was four pounds a week. It seemed easy enough, so I accepted. The next day, I started my new job. I arrived at the office at ten o'clock, and Mr. Ross gave me a desk, a chair, and a stack of paper. He showed me where to start in the encyclopedia. I began copying, and Mr. Ross left the office. Every day I worked for four hours, copying the encyclopedia. The work was boring, but the pay was good. Mr. Ross came in occasionally to see how I was doing, but otherwise, I was alone. I never saw any other members of the League. One morning, after about two months, I arrived at the office to find the door locked. There was a sign on the door that said, The Red-Headed League is dissolved. October 9th, 1890. I was shocked. I went to the landlord of the building and asked what had happened. He told me that Mr. Duncan Ross had rented the office temporarily and had left suddenly. No one knew where he had gone. Confused and upset, I went back to my shop and told Vincent what had happened. He suggested that we go to Sherlock Holmes for advice. I had heard of Mr. Holmes, the famous detective, but I had never met him. Vincent and I went to Baker Street where Mr. Holmes lived. We were shown into his sitting room by Dr. Watson, his friend and assistant. Mr. Holmes was a tall, thin man with sharp eyes and a calm manner. He listened carefully as I told him my story. When I finished, Mr. Holmes sat back and thought for a moment. Then he smiled. Mr. Wilson, he said, your case is most interesting. I believe I can help you but I need to make some inquiries first. Please come back tomorrow at the same time. 
Vincent and I left Holmes's house feeling hopeful. The next day we returned to Baker Street. Mr. Holmes greeted us with a smile. Good news, Mr. Wilson, he said. I have solved your case. The red-headed league was a clever trick to get you out of your shop for a few hours each day. I believe someone wanted access to your shop while you were away. I was astonished. But why? I asked. Holmes explained that he suspected my assistant, Vincent Spaulding, was involved. He had noticed the dirt on Vincent's trousers, which suggested he had been digging. Holmes believed Vincent was trying to dig a tunnel from my cellar to the bank next door. Mr. Holmes suggested we go to my shop at once. When we arrived, he asked Vincent to show him the cellar. Vincent seemed nervous, but he agreed. In the cellar, Holmes found a newly dug tunnel leading towards the bank. At that moment, the police arrived, having been called by Mr. Holmes earlier. They arrested Vincent, whose real name was John Clay, a notorious criminal. Thanks to Sherlock Holmes, the mystery of the Red-Headed League was solved and a dangerous criminal was caught. I was grateful to Mr. Holmes and returned to my quiet life as a pawnbroker. The adventure was over, but it taught me to be more careful in the future. Chapter 2 Mr. Wilson's Story As I sat in Sherlock Holmes's sitting room, I could not help but feel a mix of relief and curiosity. The previous day's events were still fresh in my mind. The strange advertisement, the mysterious disappearance of the Red-Headed League, and the unexpected revelation about Vincent Spaulding had all left me bewildered. Now, it was time to tell my full story to Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. Please, Mr. Wilson, Holmes said, tell us everything from the beginning. I took a deep breath and began. As you know, I am a pawnbroker. I own a small shop on Coburg Square. It is not a large business, but it is enough for me. My assistant, Vincent Spa Ulding, is very capable. He has been with me for almost a year. Despite his young age, he works hard and knows a lot about the business. However, there was always something odd about him. He spends a lot of time in the cellar, supposedly developing photographs. I didn't mind, as long as he did his work upstairs. One morning, Vincent came to me with a newspaper. He was very excited. Mr. Wilson, he said, have you seen this advertisement? It is perfect for you. He showed me the ad for the Red-Headed League, which offered good pay for minimal work. I was sceptical at first, but Vincent was very persuasive. He convinced me to apply. I went to Fleet Street and found the office. There were many men with red hair waiting. I felt a bit silly, but I joined the line. After a long wait, I was called into the office by Mr. Duncan Ross. He asked me many questions about my background and examined my hair closely. Then he told me I had the job. I was to copy the Encyclopedia Britannica for four pounds a week. I started the next day. The work was easy, but tedious. I copied for four hours each day, from ten in the morning until two in the afternoon. Mr. Ross checked on me occasionally, but otherwise I was alone. This continued for about eight weeks. I got used to the routine, and the money was good. Then, one morning, I arrived to find the office closed. There was a sign on the door, The Red-Headed League is Dissolved, October 9th, 1890. I was shocked and confused. I went to the landlord, but he knew nothing. Mr. Ross had left without a word. I went back to my shop and told Vincent. He suggested we come to you, Mr. Holmes, and here we are. I finished my story, feeling a bit embarrassed. It seemed foolish now, but at the time it had felt real. Holmes listened carefully, his sharp eyes never leaving my face. When I finished, he leaned back in his chair and steepled his fingers. Interesting, he said. 
Very interesting. Tell me, Mr. Wilson, this assistant of yours, Vincent Spaulding, what do you know about him? Not much, I admitted. He came to me a year ago, asking for work. He said he wanted to learn the business. I took him on because he asked for half the usual wages. Holmes nodded. Describe him for me. He is small, but very quick, I said. He has a white mark on his forehead where he was hit with acid. He is always in the cellar, working on his photography. Holmes sat up straight. White scar, you say? This is very important, Mr. Wilson. Your assistant is John Clay, one of the most wanted criminals in London. He is known for his clever disguises and his daring crimes. Now, tell me, have you noticed anything unusual in your shop recently? I thought for a moment. Well, now that you mention it, there was a lot of digging noises from the cellar. Vincent said he was making space for his photographic equipment. Holmes smiled. I believe we have solved the mystery, Mr. Wilson. The red-headed league was a ruse to keep you out of your shop. While you were away, your assistant was digging a tunnel to the bank next door. I was stunned. A tunnel? But why? To rob the bank's vault, Holmes replied. They planned to break in from below. We must act quickly. Dr. Watson, we need to visit the bank and inform the police. We left at once, hurrying to the nearby bank. Mr. Merriweather, the bank manager, was surprised to see us. Holmes quickly explained the situation. The manager was sceptical, but agreed to show us the vault. In the dim light of the cellar, Holmes pointed to the floor. Here, he said. This is where they will come through. He directed us to hide behind some crates. We waited in the dark, our breaths shallow, the air thick with anticipation. Hours passed, and then we heard the faint sound of scraping. Slowly, a small hole appeared in the floor, growing larger with each moment. Suddenly, a hand emerged, followed by a head. It was Vincent Spaulding, John Clay, covered in dirt. Holmes sprang forward, followed by the police. There was a brief struggle, but the criminals were caught. Vincent, or rather John Clay, was furious, but he was no match for the police. As the police led the criminals away, Mr. Merriweather thanked Holmes profusely. You have saved us from a great loss, Mr. Holmes. How can we ever repay you? Holmes smiled. No payment is necessary. The satisfaction of solving the case is enough. Back at Baker Street, Holmes and Watson congratulated me. Mr. Wilson, Holmes said, you have been very brave. Thanks to you, a great crime has been prevented. I left feeling grateful and relieved. The adventure had been unexpected and frightening, but it was over. My life returned to normal but I would never forget the day I met Sherlock Holmes and the strange adventure of the Red-Headed League. Chapter 3 The Job Begins The very next day after my conversation with Vincent Spaulding about the advertisement, I found myself standing at the address specified, Seven Popes Court, Fleet Street. It was a gloomy, narrow alley, lined with old buildings that seemed to huddle together against the cold London fog. I was nervous, but I reminded myself of the potential reward. Four pounds a week was not to be ignored. When I arrived, the door was already open, and I joined a queue of red-headed men waiting inside. It was quite a sight. All shades of red hair, from fiery orange to deep auburn, crowded into one small space. I felt a mix of excitement and unease as I waited my turn. After what seemed like hours, I was called into the office by a small man with bright red hair and a friendly smile. He introduced himself as Mr. Duncan Ross. Welcome to the Red-Headed League, Mr. Wilson, he said warmly. Please have a seat. 
I sat down, and he began to ask me a series of questions. They were all very personal, about my family, my background, and even my education. I answered honestly, though I was not sure why such details were necessary for copying the Encyclopedia Britannica. Finally, Mr. Ross stood up and examined my hair closely, as if verifying its authenticity. Congratulations, Mr. Wilson, he said, after a thorough inspection. You are exactly what we are looking for. The job is yours. I could hardly believe my luck. What exactly is the job? I asked, trying to keep my excitement in check. It is very simple, Mr. Ross explained. You will be copying the Encyclopedia Britannica. You will work here in this office from ten in the morning until two in the afternoon, Monday through Saturday. You must not leave the building during those hours. The salary is four pounds a week, paid at the end of each week. The terms were straightforward enough, and the pay was more than fair. I agreed without hesitation. Mr. Ross handed me a pen, ink, and a stack of paper, and showed me where to start in the encyclopedia. My task was to copy the text, word for word, as neatly as possible. The first day was tedious. I sat at the small desk, writing steadily for four hours. The room was quiet, and the only sound was the scratching of my pen on the paper. Mr. Ross came in occasionally to check on my progress, but otherwise I was alone. It was hard work, but the thought of the money kept me going. The routine continued for several days. Each morning I arrived at the office promptly at ten o'clock. Mr. Ross would greet me, and I would take my place at the desk, copying the encyclopedia. The work was monotonous, but I found a certain rhythm to it. The hours passed quickly, and at two o'clock I would put down my pen and leave, looking forward to my next day's work. After a week I received my first payment four crisp one-pound notes. I was elated. It felt good to be earning extra money, and the work, though dull, was easy enough. I began to think I had found a perfect arrangement. However, I couldn't help but notice a few peculiarities. For one, I never saw any other members of the Red-Headed League. Despite the crowded room on the first day, I was always alone in the office. Mr. Ross was the only other person I ever saw, and even he appeared only occasionally. Another oddity was the lack of progress I seemed to be making. No matter how much I copied, the stack of paper in front of me never seemed to get any smaller. It was as if the encyclopedia was endless. I mentioned this to Mr. Ross, but he just smiled and told me to keep working. One day, about two months into the job, I arrived at the office to find the door locked. There was a note pinned to it, written in large, bold letters. The Red-Headed League is dissolved. October 9th, 1890. I was stunned. What did it mean? I tried knocking on the door, but there was no answer. I waited for a while, hoping Mr. Ross would appear, but he did not. Finally, I went to the landlord of the building to ask if he knew what had happened. The landlord was a gruff old man who seemed annoyed by my questions. The Red-Headed League, he said, scratching his head. Oh, that was just a temporary thing. They rented the office for a few months, but they've moved out now. No idea where they've gone. I felt a wave of confusion and frustration. The job that had seemed so perfect had vanished without a trace, leaving me with more questions than answers. I went back to my shop and told Vincent Spaulding what had happened. He listened carefully, a thoughtful look on his face. Mr. Wilson, he said after a moment, I think you should talk to Mr. Sherlock Holmes. He is a famous detective. If anyone can figure this out, he can.
the idea made sense. I had heard of Sherlock Holmes, of course. His reputation for solving difficult cases was well known. I decided to take Vincent's advice and visit Holmes the next day. The following morning, I made my way to Baker Street, where Sherlock Holmes lived. I felt a bit nervous as I knocked on the door, but I was determined to get to the bottom of this mystery. A kind-looking man opened the door and introduced himself as Dr. Watson, Mr. Holmes's friend and assistant. He showed me into a cosy sitting room where Holmes was waiting. Mr. Holmes was a tall, thin man with sharp features and piercing eyes. He greeted me politely and asked me to sit down. I recounted my story in detail, from the strange advertisement to the abrupt disappearance of the red-headed league. Holmes listened intently, his expression serious. When I finished, he leaned back in his chair and steepled his fingers. Mr. Wilson, he said, your case is most intriguing. I believe it warrants further investigation. I will need to make some inquiries, but I am confident we can find out what is behind this red-headed league. His words gave me hope. I thanked him and left, feeling that I had come to the right place. As I walked back to my shop, I couldn't help but wonder what secrets Sherlock Holmes would uncover. Chapter 4 The Disappearance The day after my visit to Sherlock Holmes, I awoke with a renewed sense of purpose. The mystery of the Red-Headed League and its sudden disappearance still puzzled me, but knowing that Holmes was on the case gave me hope. I decided to visit my shop early to see if Vincent had any new insights. When I arrived, Vincent was already there, busy with his usual tasks. He greeted me with a smile. Good morning, Mr. Wilson. Did you manage to speak with Mr. Holmes? Yes, I replied, and he found the situation very interesting. He promised to investigate further. Vincent nodded. That's good to hear. Mr. Holmes is very clever. If anyone can solve this, he can. As the morning passed, I couldn't stop thinking about the red-headed league and what it all meant. I kept replaying the events in my mind, trying to find any detail I might have missed. By midday, I decided I needed to step out and clear my head. I left Vincent in charge of the shop and went for a walk. The streets of London were busy as usual, with people hurrying to and fro. I wandered aimlessly, my mind still on the strange advertisement and the sudden dissolution of the League. After a while, I found myself near Fleet Street, close to where the office of the Red-Headed League had been. Out of curiosity, I walked to Pope's Court. The building looked the same as before, old and quiet. I climbed the stairs to the now-closed office and stood before the locked door. The sign announcing the dissolution was still there, mocking me with its simple message. I felt a surge of frustration and helplessness. Just as I was about to leave, I heard footsteps behind me. I turned to see Mr. Duncan Ross himself walking up the stairs. He looked surprised to see me. Mr. Wilson, he exclaimed, what are you doing here? I could ask you the same question, I replied, trying to keep my voice calm. What happened to the Red-Headed League? Why did it close so suddenly? Mr. Ross looked uncomfortable. I'm afraid I can't discuss the details, Mr. Wilson. The League was dissolved due to unforeseen circumstances. I assure you there was no ill intent. Unforeseen circumstances? I repeated, feeling my frustration grow. That's not a very satisfactory explanation, Mr. Ross. I deserve to know the truth. Before he could respond, a voice interrupted us. Mr. Ross, there you are. I've been looking for you. It was a tall man with a serious expression. He glanced at me and then back at Mr. Ross. We need to go, now. Mr. Ross nodded, looking relieved. I'm sorry, Mr. Wilson, I really must go. Good day. With that, he hurried down the stairs with the other man, 
leaving me standing there bewildered. I felt more confused than ever. What was really going on? Determined to find answers, I decided to return to Baker Street and update Mr. Holmes on what had happened. When I arrived, Holmes was at his usual spot, deep in thought. Dr. Watson was there as well, reading a newspaper. Holmes looked up as I entered. Mr. Wilson, he said, you look troubled. Have you discovered something new? I recounted my encounter with Mr. Ross and the mysterious man who had taken him away. Holmes listened carefully, his sharp eyes never leaving my face. When I finished, he nodded slowly. Interesting, he said. Very interesting indeed. What do you think it means? I asked, hoping for some clarity. I have my suspicions, Holmes replied, but I need more information. I believe the dissolution of the Red-Headed League was a ruse designed to distract you. We must find out what Mr. Ross and his accomplice are really up to. He stood up and grabbed his coat. Come, Watson, we need to pay a visit to Mr. Jabez Wilson's shop. Dr. Watson put down his newspaper and followed Holmes out the door. I hurried after them, feeling a mix of excitement and apprehension. We arrived at my shop in no time, and I led them inside. Vincent was there, as always, busy with his tasks. He looked up in surprise as we entered. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, welcome. How can I help you? Holmes ignored the question and began inspecting the shop, his keen eyes taking in every detail. He moved quickly, examining the counters, the shelves, and the floor. Finally, he stopped near the cellar door. Mr. Wilson, he said, may I see the cellar? Of course, I replied, opening the door. We all followed Holmes down the narrow stairs. The cellar was dimly lit and cluttered with various items. Vincent's photography equipment was in one corner, and there was a strong smell of chemicals in the air. Holmes began to examine the floor, tapping it with his cane. He stopped in one spot and knelt down, inspecting it closely. Here, he said, pointing to a section of the floor. This area has been disturbed recently. Someone has been digging. I felt a chill run down my spine. Digging? But why? Holmes stood up, his expression serious. I believe they were trying to tunnel into the bank vault next door. The red-headed league was a clever ploy to get you out of the shop. They needed you away so they could dig in secret. Vincent looked shocked. A tunnel? But who would do such a thing? John Clay, Holmes replied. Your assistant is none other than John Clay, a notorious criminal. He used the red-headed league to distract you while he and his accomplices dug the tunnel. I was stunned. I had trusted Vincent, and now it turned out he was a criminal. What should we do? I asked, feeling overwhelmed. We must act quickly, Holmes said. We need to inform the police and set a trap. They will likely attempt the robbery tonight. Holmes instructed us to secure the cellar and then led us back upstairs. He wrote a quick note and sent it with a messenger to Inspector Jones of Scotland Yard. We will wait for the police to arrive, he said. In the meantime, Mr. Wilson, you must stay calm. This will all be over soon. As we waited, I couldn't help but feel a mix of fear and anger. How could I have been so blind? Vincent had fooled me completely, but thanks to Sherlock Holmes, the truth was finally coming to light. When the police arrived, Inspector Jones took charge. Holmes explained the situation, and they set up a stakeout in my shop. We waited in tense silence, hoping to catch the criminals in the act. Hours passed, and then, just as Holmes had predicted, we heard the sound of digging from the cellar. The police moved quickly, 
surrounding the area. As the criminals broke through the floor, they were met by a wall of officers. There was a brief struggle, but the police quickly overpowered them. Vincent Spaulding, or rather John Clay, was captured, along with his accomplice. They were both taken away in handcuffs, their plan foiled. Holmes turned to me with a satisfied smile. Mr. Wilson, your ordeal is over. Thanks to your vigilance, we have stopped a major crime. I felt a wave of relief wash over me. The nightmare was finally over. I thanked Holmes and the police for their help. As I watched the criminals being led away, I realized how lucky I was to have met Sherlock Holmes. Chapter 5 Seeking Holmes's Help The next morning I awoke early, my mind still reeling from the events of the previous day. The shocking revelation about Vincent Spaulding, or rather John Clay, had left me feeling both betrayed and foolish. Yet, there was also a sense of relief, knowing that the notorious criminal had been apprehended. With the Red-Headed League still a mystery, I knew I needed to seek Sherlock Holmes's help once more to understand the full picture. As the sun began to rise over London, I prepared myself for another visit to Baker Street. I quickly ate a light breakfast and made my way through the bustling streets, determined to get to the bottom of this strange affair. Upon arriving at 221B Baker Street, I was greeted by Mrs. Hudson, the landlady, who showed me into the familiar sitting room. Holmes was already there, seated in his usual armchair, his sharp eyes scanning the morning newspaper. Dr. Watson was at the table, writing in his journal. Holmes looked up as I entered, a slight smile playing on his lips. Good morning, Mr. Wilson, he said. I trust you slept well despite the excitement of yesterday? I did. Thank you, Mr. Holmes, I replied, taking a seat opposite him. But I still have many questions. The red-headed league and the sudden disappearance of Mr. Duncan Ross. It all seems so mysterious. Holmes nodded thoughtfully. Indeed, Mr. Wilson. The red-headed league was merely a clever ruse, a distraction to keep you occupied while John Clay and his accomplices worked on their true objective. Tunneling into the bank vault. I leaned forward, eager for more information. But how did you figure it out, Mr. Holmes? How did you know that Vincent, John Clay, was up to something? Holmes smiled, his eyes twinkling with the thrill of the chase. It was a matter of observation and deduction. When you first told me about the Red-Headed League, the peculiar nature of the advertisement and the generous salary immediately struck me as odd. It seemed too good to be true, and such situations often are. He continued, When I visited your shop and observed your assistant, I noticed the telltale signs of digging on his trousers and the dirt under his fingernails. That, combined with his frequent trips to the cellar, indicated that he was engaged in more than just photography. Dr. Watson nodded in agreement, adding, Holmes also deduced that the target must be the nearby bank. It was the most logical conclusion given the circumstances. I listened intently, amazed by Holmes's ability to piece together the puzzle with such clarity. So, the Red-Headed League was just a way to keep me out of the shop. Exactly, Holmes replied. By keeping you occupied with the tedious task of copying the encyclopedia, they ensured you would not be present to notice their activities in the cellar. It was a clever scheme, but not clever enough to escape detection. Feeling a mix of admiration and gratitude, I thanked Holmes for his assistance. I don't know what I would have done without your help, Mr. Holmes. You have saved me from a great deal of trouble. Holmes waved off my thanks with a modest smile. It was my pleasure, Mr. Wilson. Cases like yours are what keep my mind sharp and my skills honed. But tell me, 
Have you decided what to do now that the Red-Headed League is no more? I paused, considering his question. I suppose I will return to my usual work at the pawn shop. It's been a reliable source of income, and I enjoy the routine. Holmes nodded approvingly. That sounds like a sensible plan. Just be sure to remain vigilant in the future. Criminals often prey on those who appear unsuspecting. I promised to heed his advice and took my leave, feeling a renewed sense of confidence. As I walked back to my shop, I couldn't help but marvel at the twists and turns my life had taken in such a short time. The encounter with the Red-Headed League had been unexpected and bewildering, but thanks to Sherlock Holmes, I had emerged wiser and more cautious. Upon returning to Coburg Square, I was greeted by a few curious neighbours who had heard about the arrest. They bombarded me with questions about the notorious John Clay and the mysterious Red-Headed League. I answered as best I could, though I still felt the weight of my own naivety. The days that followed were quieter. With Vincent Spaulding gone, I took on more of the daily tasks at the shop. Business continued as usual, and the routine provided a comforting sense of normalcy. Yet the experience had left a lasting impression on me. I found myself paying closer attention to the details around me, wary of anything that seemed out of place. One afternoon, as I was organising some items in the shop, a customer entered. It was Mr. Merriweather, the bank manager whom Holmes had saved from a significant loss. He looked around the shop with interest before approaching me. Mr. Wilson, he began, extending his hand. I wanted to personally thank you for your role in uncovering the plot against our bank. If it hadn't been for your actions and Mr. Holmes' quick thinking, we could have suffered a great loss. I shook his hand, feeling a sense of pride. Thank you, Mr. Merriweather. I was just fortunate to have Mr. Holmes's assistance. He nodded, his expression serious. Indeed, Holmes is a remarkable man. If there's ever anything the bank can do to assist you, please don't hesitate to ask. We exchanged a few more pleasantries before he left, and I returned to my work with a renewed sense of purpose. The experience with the Red-Headed League had taught me valuable lessons about trust, vigilance, and the importance of seeking help when faced with the unknown. As the weeks passed, the memory of the strange advertisement and the events that followed began to fade, becoming just another story in the rich tapestry of my life. But I would never forget the clever mind of Sherlock Holmes and the dramatic way in which he had unraveled the mystery that had so bewildered me. In the end, I realized that sometimes the most extraordinary adventures can happen in the most ordinary of lives, and it is in those moments of uncertainty that we truly discover our strength and resilience. Chapter 6. Holmes's Investigation After the encounter with Mr. Merriweather, life at my pawn shop began to settle back into a comfortable routine. However, the mystery of the red-headed league and the clever criminal, John Clay, still lingered in my thoughts. I couldn't help but wonder how Holmes had managed to uncover the truth so quickly. My curiosity soon led me back to Baker Street, eager to learn more about his investigative methods. When I arrived at 221B Baker Street, Holmes and Dr. Watson were in the middle of a discussion. They welcomed me warmly, and I was invited to join them. Mr. Wilson, Holmes began, I can see you are still curious about the case. Perhaps I should explain how I came to my conclusions. I nodded eagerly. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I would be very grateful. Holmes leaned back in his chair, his eyes glinting with excitement. Very well. Let me start from the beginning. When you first told me about the Red-Headed League, 
The peculiar nature of the advertisement and the generous salary immediately struck me as suspicious. Such situations often hide ulterior motives. He continued. The first clue was the nature of the job itself. Copying the Encyclopedia Britannica is a pointless task, especially for such a high salary. It was clear that the work was merely a pretext to keep you occupied. I nodded, recalling my own confusion at the time. I did think it was strange, but the money was very tempting. Holmes smiled. Exactly, Mr. Wilson. The lure of easy money can blind even the most cautious individuals. My next step was to visit your shop and observe your assistant, Vincent Spaulding. His low wages and the white scar on his forehead were significant clues. Dr. Watson chimed in. Holmes noticed the dirt on Spaulding's trousers and under his fingernails, indicating he had been digging. Holmes nodded. Indeed. The frequent trips to the cellar suggested that he was engaged in something other than photography. I deduced that he was tunnelling towards the bank vault next door. I listened intently, amazed at how Holmes had pieced everything together. And the visit to my shop confirmed your suspicions? Yes, Holmes replied. I examined the area and found evidence of recent digging. The final confirmation came when we waited in your cellar and caught John Clay in the act. Holmes paused, letting the significance of his words sink in. I marvelled at his keen observations and logical deductions. Mr. Holmes, your abilities are truly remarkable. Holmes waved off my praise with a modest smile. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Now, let us move on to the next part of our investigation. I have a few loose ends to tie up. Curious, I asked. What do you mean, Mr. Holmes? Holmes stood up and walked to his bookshelf, pulling out a large map of London. There are still some unanswered questions about the Red-Headed League. For instance, who was the mysterious man with Mr. Duncan Ross? And what was their ultimate goal? He spread the map on the table and pointed to a few locations. I believe they had other plans that we have yet to uncover. Dr. Watson and I will visit a few places that might provide more clues. Would you like to join us, Mr. Wilson? Eager to see Holmes in action once more, I agreed. We left Baker Street and headed towards the first location on Holmes's list, a small office building in the heart of London. As we approached, Holmes explained, This building houses several businesses, including one that rented the office where the Red-Headed League operated. We need to find out more about their tenants. Inside, we were greeted by a receptionist who seemed slightly nervous at our questions. Holmes, with his usual charm, quickly put her at ease. We are looking into the recent activities of a certain Mr. Duncan Ross. Could you tell us which company he was associated with? The receptionist checked her records and replied, Mr. Ross worked for a company called Coburg Holdings. They rented an office here for a few months, but they moved out suddenly. Holmes thanked her, and we left the building. Coburg Holdings, he mused. An interesting name, don't you think, Mr. Wilson? I nodded, not entirely sure what he meant. Holmes continued. Coburg Holdings is a front for a group of criminals, including John Clay. They use various names and offices to cover their tracks. Our next stop was a small cafe, where Holmes had arranged to meet one of his informants, a man named Wiggins. Wiggins was a scruffy young man, but Holmes trusted him for his street smarts and connections. When we arrived, Wiggins was already waiting, sipping a cup of tea. Mr. Holmes, he greeted, I've got the information you wanted. Holmes sat down and motioned for us to do the same. Excellent, Wiggins. 
Tell me what you've found. Wiggins leaned in and spoke in a low voice. Coburg Holdings has been involved in several shady deals around London. They move from place to place, setting up fake businesses to cover their real activities. Word on the street is that they were planning something big before you stopped them. Holmes listened carefully, nodding as Wiggins spoke. Thank you, Wiggins. This information is very helpful. Keep your ears open and let me know if you hear anything else. With that, we left the cafe and returned to Baker Street. Holmes was deep in thought, his mind working through the new information. When we arrived, he turned to me. Mr. Wilson, it appears that the Red-Headed League was just one part of a larger scheme. We have uncovered some of their operations, but there is still more to be done. I felt a mix of awe and gratitude. Mr. Holmes, I cannot thank you enough for your help. You have opened my eyes to a world I never knew existed. Holmes smiled. It has been my pleasure, Mr. Wilson. Remember, always stay vigilant and question anything that seems too good to be true. As I left Baker Street, I felt a renewed sense of confidence and determination. The experience had taught me valuable lessons, and I knew I would never forget the incredible skills and insights of Sherlock Holmes. I returned to my shop with a clearer mind and a resolve to be more cautious in the future. Life at the pawn shop resumed its normal pace, but the memory of the red-headed league and Holmes's brilliant investigation stayed with me. I knew that if ever faced with another mystery, I would not hesitate to seek the help of the great detective once more. Chapter 7 A Closer Look As the days passed, the memory of the Red-Headed League and its unexpected end continued to linger in my mind. The strange events had left a lasting impression, and I couldn't shake the feeling that there was still more to uncover. My curiosity finally got the better of me, and I decided to take a closer look at everything that had happened. I wanted to understand the full extent of the scheme and how I had been so easily deceived. I knew that Sherlock Holmes had a keen eye for detail and an unmatched ability to see what others missed. Inspired by his methods, I resolved to conduct my own investigation, following the clues I had gathered and examining them with fresh eyes. I began by revisiting the office where the Red-Headed League had been based. Though it was now empty and quiet, I hoped that there might still be some evidence left behind. The building's landlord remembered me and allowed me to look around. As I examined the dusty room, I found it difficult to believe that such a grand scheme had been orchestrated from such an ordinary place. I started with the desk where I had spent so many hours copying the Encyclopedia Britannica. There was nothing unusual about it at first glance, but I remembered how Holmes had taught me to look beyond the obvious. I carefully examined the drawers, the underside of the desk, and even the floor around it. To my surprise, I found a small hidden compartment in one of the drawers. Inside, there were a few scraps of paper with notes and diagrams. The notes were written in a hurried, almost frantic style. Most of it was indecipherable to me, but a few phrases stood out. Tunnel, vault, and timing is crucial. I realized that these were likely the plans for the tunnel that John Clay and his accomplices had dug. Feeling a surge of excitement, I took the notes and decided to visit Holmes again. He would know what to make of them. When I arrived at 221B Baker Street, I found Holmes and Dr. Watson in the sitting room, deep in conversation. Mr. Wilson, Holmes greeted me with a smile. What brings you here today? I found these notes in the old office of the Red-Headed League, I said, handing them to him. I thought they might be important. Holmes took the notes and examined them carefully. 
His eyes narrowed as he read through the scribbled phrases. Interesting, he muttered. Very interesting indeed. Dr. Watson leaned over to look at the notes as well. What do you make of it, Holmes? These are indeed the plans for the tunnel, Holmes replied. It seems that John Clay and his accomplices were more meticulous than I initially thought. The timing was crucial to their success, and they had mapped out every detail. I felt a sense of satisfaction knowing that my discovery had been useful. Is there anything else we can learn from these notes? I asked. Holmes nodded. Yes, Mr. Wilson. These notes confirm that the Red-Headed League was part of a larger operation. They also suggest that there may be other targets and plans that we have yet to uncover. He turned to me with a serious expression. Mr. Wilson, would you be willing to assist me in investigating this further? Your familiarity with the case and the locations involved could prove invaluable. I agreed without hesitation, eager to continue the adventure and learn more from the great detective. Holmes quickly laid out a plan. We would start by revisiting some of the locations mentioned in the notes and speaking to anyone who might have information about Coburg Holdings and its activities. Our first stop was a small warehouse on the outskirts of London, where one of the notes indicated supplies had been stored. The warehouse was old and decrepit, but we found a caretaker who was willing to speak with us. Yes, I remember those fellows, the caretaker said. They rented the place for a few months, brought in a lot of equipment, said they were setting up a printing business, but they left in a hurry not too long ago. Holmes examined the warehouse, noting the large crates and various tools left behind. It seems they abandoned their operation quickly, he observed. Perhaps our intervention forced them to change their plans. As we continued our investigation, we visited several other locations linked to Coburg Holdings. Each place revealed a little more about the group's activities. We found evidence of fake businesses, hidden tunnels, and plans for other robberies. It became clear that John Clay and his accomplices were part of a sophisticated network of criminals. One evening, as we sat in Holmes's sitting room reviewing our findings, Holmes turned to me with a thoughtful expression. Mr. Wilson, your persistence and keen observations have been crucial in unravelling this case. You have a natural talent for detective work. I felt a swell of pride at his words. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. I have learned so much from you. Holmes smiled. And there is still more to learn. Our investigation is far from over, but I believe we are making significant progress. With each clue we uncover, we get closer to dismantling this criminal network. In the following weeks, we continued to piece together the puzzle. We tracked down more members of the gang and gathered enough evidence to bring them to justice. The police, with Holmes's guidance, conducted several raids, resulting in numerous arrests. Throughout the investigation, I was amazed by Holmes's ability to see connections where others saw none. His logical mind and attention to detail were unmatched, and I felt privileged to work alongside him. As the case drew to a close, I reflected on the incredible journey I had undertaken. The experience had transformed me from a simple pawnbroker into an amateur detective, and I felt a sense of accomplishment and pride. One evening, as we sat in the sitting room, Holmes raised his glass in a toast. To Mr. Wilson, whose bravery and determination have been instrumental in solving this case, may your future be filled with many more adventures. We clinked glasses, and I couldn't help but smile. The adventure of the Red-Headed League had changed my life in ways I never imagined, and I knew that with Holmes's guidance, I would continue to face whatever challenges came my way with confidence and courage. Chapter 8 
planning the stakeout. The weeks following our discovery at the warehouse were filled with activity. Holmes and I worked tirelessly, piecing together the complex web of the red-headed league and its criminal network. We gathered evidence, interviewed witnesses, and mapped out their various operations. Each new clue brought us closer to understanding their full plan. One afternoon, as we sat in Holmes's sitting room, reviewing our latest findings, Holmes looked up from his notes with a determined expression. Mr. Wilson, I believe we have enough information to set a trap for the remaining members of this gang. I felt a surge of excitement. What do you propose, Mr. Holmes? Holmes leaned forward, his eyes gleaming with anticipation. We need to plan a stakeout. The gang's next target is a bank on the other side of London. According to our sources, they plan to strike tomorrow night. If we act quickly, we can catch them in the act. Dr. Watson, who had been listening quietly, spoke up. Holmes, how do you intend to proceed? Holmes spread out a map of London on the table, pointing to the bank in question. We will need to inform the police and coordinate with them. They will provide additional manpower. Mr. Wilson, your familiarity with the gang's methods will be invaluable. We must be thorough and precise. We spent the next several hours planning every detail of the stakeout. Holmes's meticulous nature ensured that no aspect was overlooked. He assigned specific roles to each of us, outlining our positions and responsibilities. As the sun set, casting long shadows over the city, we headed to the bank to make our preparations. Inspector Jones of Scotland Yard met us there, along with several officers. Holmes briefed them on the plan, his calm authority instilling confidence in everyone present. Inspector Jones, Holmes began, we believe the gang will enter through a tunnel they have been digging from a nearby abandoned building. We need to position officers both inside the bank and at the entrance to the tunnel. Timing is crucial. We must catch them as they emerge. Inspector Jones nodded, his face serious. Understood, Mr. Holmes. My men are ready. Holmes turned to me. Mr. Wilson, you and I will position ourselves inside the bank vault. Watson, you will stay outside with the police, ready to move in once we give the signal. With our roles defined, we set about preparing the bank. Holmes and I made our way to the vault, a heavy iron door that seemed impenetrable. Inside, the air was cool, and the walls were lined with rows of safe deposit boxes. We found a hiding spot behind a large stack of boxes, where we could see the entrance but remain concealed. As we settled into our positions, the tension began to build. The hours passed slowly, each tick of the clock echoing in the silence. Holmes remained calm and focused, his keen eyes scanning the room for any sign of movement. Around midnight, we heard the faint sound of scraping. Holmes nodded to me, signalling that the time had come. We strained our ears, listening as the sound grew louder. A section of the floor began to shift, and a small hole appeared, gradually widening as the intruders worked their way through the tunnel. Holmes placed a finger to his lips, reminding me to stay silent. We watched as the first figure emerged from the hole. It was John Clay, his face smudged with dirt and his eyes gleaming with determination. Behind him, another man followed, carrying tools and sacks. Holmes waited until both men were fully inside the vault before giving the signal. He leaped forward, his voice commanding and firm. Stop right there! You are surrounded! John Clay's eyes widened in shock, but he quickly regained his composure. He reached for his gun, but Holmes was faster, knocking it from his hand with a swift movement. The other man tried to flee back into the tunnel, but the police were already closing in. 
Inspector Jones and his officers rushed into the vault, securing the intruders and placing them in handcuffs. The look of defeat on John Clay's face was unmistakable. He knew the game was up. Well done, Mr. Holmes, Inspector Jones said, shaking his hand. Another victory for the great detective. Holmes nodded modestly. Thank you, Inspector, but this victory belongs to all of us. Mr. Wilson, your courage and persistence played a crucial role in bringing these criminals to justice. I felt a swell of pride at Holmes's words. The months of uncertainty and danger had finally come to an end, and we had emerged victorious. As the police led the captured criminals away, I couldn't help but reflect on how far we had come since the strange advertisement first appeared in my shop. The following morning, Holmes, Watson and I returned to Baker Street. We were exhausted, but satisfied with our success. Mrs. Hudson greeted us with a warm smile and a pot of hot tea, which we gratefully accepted. As we sat in the sitting room, Holmes leaned back in his chair, a thoughtful expression on his face. This case has been one of the more complex and rewarding ones we've tackled. It is a testament to what can be achieved through observation, deduction and teamwork. Dr. Watson nodded in agreement. Indeed, Holmes, and Mr. Wilson, you have proven yourself to be a valuable ally. I smiled, feeling a deep sense of gratitude for the friendship and mentorship I had found in Holmes and Watson. Thank you, both of you. This experience has changed my life in ways I never expected. Holmes raised his teacup in a toast. To justice and to the unending pursuit of truth. We clinked our cups together, the sound ringing with the promise of future adventures. Though the case of the Red-Headed League was closed, I knew that there would always be new mysteries to solve and new challenges to face. With Holmes and Watson by my side, I felt ready to face whatever came next. Chapter 9. The Bank Vault after our successful stakeout and the capture of John Clay and his accomplices, I returned to my regular life with a renewed sense of purpose. The excitement of the case had awakened something in me, a curiosity and a desire to understand the world more deeply. Despite my return to the routine of the pawn shop, I often found myself reflecting on the adventure and the lessons I had learned. One afternoon, as I was organising some items in the shop, a familiar face walked in. It was Mr. Merriweather, the bank manager. He looked around the shop with interest before approaching me. Good afternoon, Mr. Wilson, he said, shaking my hand warmly. I wanted to thank you again for your role in uncovering the plot against our bank. Mr. Holmes has spoken highly of you. I felt a swell of pride at his words. Thank you, Mr. Merriweather. It was quite an experience. He nodded. Indeed it was. I was hoping you might be interested in seeing the bank vault now that the repairs are complete. We've made some improvements, and I'd be honoured to give you a tour. I accepted his invitation eagerly. The idea of seeing the place where the criminals had planned their heist intrigued me. We left the shop and made our way to the bank, the sun casting long shadows as the afternoon turned into evening. Upon our arrival at the bank, Mr. Merriweather led me through the grand entrance and down a series of narrow corridors. The air grew cooler as we descended into the lower levels. Finally, we reached the heavy iron door of the vault, its surface gleaming under the dim lights. Here we are! Mr. Merriweather said, unlocking the door with a large key. The door swung open with a creak, revealing the vault's interior. The vault was an impressive sight. Rows of safe deposit boxes lined the walls, each one carefully secured. In the centre of the room stood several large, reinforced cabinets containing the bank's most valuable assets. The room was meticulously organised, a testament to the bank's dedication to security. As you can see, 
Mr. Merriweather began. We've taken additional precautions to ensure the safety of our clients' valuables. The tunnel dug by the criminals has been filled in and reinforced. We've also installed new surveillance equipment to monitor the area more effectively. I walked around the vault, examining the sturdy construction and the advanced security measures. It was clear that the bank had spared no expense in fortifying the vault. As I explored, I couldn't help but think back to the night of the stakeout, the tension and the triumph of catching the criminals in the act. Mr. Merriweather continued, The improvements were necessary after the close call we had. Thanks to you and Mr. Holmes, we were able to prevent a significant loss. I cannot express how grateful we are. I smiled, feeling a deep sense of satisfaction. It was an honor to help. I'm glad we were able to stop them. As we finished the tour, Mr. Merriweather led me back to his office, where we sat and discussed the events of the case in more detail. He shared stories of other attempted robberies the bank had thwarted over the years, each one a testament to the ongoing battle between criminals and those who sought to protect against them. When I finally left the bank, the sun had set, and the streets were bathed in the soft glow of street lamps. I walked back to my shop, reflecting on the day's events and the journey I had undertaken since the appearance of that strange advertisement for the Red-Headed League. Back at the shop, I found myself thinking about Holmes and Watson. Their unwavering dedication to justice and their remarkable skills had left a lasting impression on me, I decided to pay them a visit the next day, eager to share my experiences and learn more from the great detective. The following morning, I arrived at 221 B Baker Street to find Holmes and Watson deep in discussion over a new case. They welcomed me warmly, and Holmes invited me to join them. Mr. Wilson, Holmes said, his eyes twinkling with curiosity. What brings you here today? I wanted to share my visit to the bank vault with you, I replied, recounting the details of my tour and the improvements made to the security measures. Holmes listened intently, nodding in approval. It seems Mr. Merriweather has taken all the necessary precautions. It is good to hear that the bank is now better protected. Dr. Watson added, your involvement in the case has been invaluable, Mr. Wilson. You have a natural talent for observation and deduction. I felt a warm glow at their praise. Thank you both. I have learned so much from you. Holmes leaned back in his chair, a thoughtful expression on his face. Mr. Wilson, have you ever considered pursuing a career in investigation? You have shown great promise and a keen interest in the field. The idea took me by surprise. I had never thought of myself as a detective, but the adventure with the Red-Headed League had certainly sparked a new passion within me. I hadn't considered it, but the idea does intrigue me. Holmes smiled. If you are interested, I would be more than happy to mentor you. There is much to learn, and I believe you have the potential to become a skilled investigator. Dr. Watson nodded in agreement. Holmes is right. You have a natural aptitude for this work. I felt a mix of excitement and gratitude. I would be honored to learn from you, Mr. Holmes. Thank you for the opportunity. From that day forward, I began to spend more time at Baker Street studying under Holmes and assisting him with his cases. Each day brought new challenges and new lessons, and I quickly found myself immersed in the world of investigation. The case of the Red-Headed League had been just the beginning. With Holmes and Watson as my mentors, I knew that there were many more adventures ahead. Together, we would continue to seek justice and uncover the truth no matter where the path might lead.
Chapter 10 The Waiting Game The thrill of learning from Sherlock Holmes was unlike anything I had ever experienced. His sharp mind and keen sense of observation were both inspiring and challenging. Under his mentorship, I was rapidly developing my skills as an investigator. One evening, as we sat in the sitting room of 221 B. Baker Street, Holmes received a letter that would lead us to our next adventure. The letter was from Inspector Jones, who had been instrumental in our previous case. It contained information about a new gang of criminals operating in London. They were planning a major heist, and the police needed Holmes's expertise to prevent it. Holmes read the letter carefully, and then looked up at Watson and me with a determined expression. Inspector Jones needs our help, he said. A gang is planning to rob the Royal Treasury. We must act quickly to stop them. Watson and I exchanged glances, both eager to begin. Holmes wasted no time in outlining our plan. We would stake out the Royal Treasury, gather intelligence, and intercept the criminals before they could execute their plan. The waiting game began. The next night, we positioned ourselves near the Royal Treasury. Holmes had arranged for us to use a small abandoned building across the street as our base of operations. From there, we had a clear view of the entrance and the surrounding area. Inspector Jones had placed several plainclothes officers in strategic positions to assist us. As we settled into our positions, Holmes handed me a pair of binoculars. Keep a close eye on the entrance, he instructed. Look for anything unusual. The hours passed slowly. The streets were mostly quiet, with only the occasional pedestrian or carriage passing by. I focused intently on the entrance, my mind alert for any sign of trouble. Holmes and Watson remained equally vigilant, their eyes scanning the area with practiced precision. Around midnight, the atmosphere changed. A group of men appeared, moving stealthily toward the entrance of the Royal Treasury. They were dressed in dark clothing and carried large bags, clearly prepared for their heist. I signaled to Holmes, who nodded and gestured for us to remain silent. Holmes whispered, Wait until they are inside. We need to catch them in the act. We watched as the men expertly picked the lock and slipped inside the building. Holmes gave the signal, and Inspector Jones and his officers moved in, surrounding the entrance. We waited in tense silence, our hearts pounding as the minutes ticked by. Suddenly, a loud crash echoed from within the treasury, followed by shouts and the sound of a struggle. Holmes and I rushed to the entrance, joining the police as they stormed the building. Inside, chaos reigned. The gang had been caught off guard, and a fierce fight ensued. Holmes moved swiftly, his movements precise and calculated. He directed the officers, ensuring that each criminal was apprehended. I did my best to assist, using the skills I had learned under Holmes's tutelage. The battle was intense, but within minutes, the gang was subdued their plans thwarted. Inspector Jones approached us, a look of relief on his face. Excellent work, Mr. Holmes. We couldn't have done it without you. Holmes nodded modestly. It was a team effort, Inspector. Mr. Wilson and Dr. Watson played crucial roles. I felt a surge of pride at Holmes's words. The waiting game had paid off and we had successfully prevented a major crime. As the police led the criminals away, I couldn't help but reflect on how far I had come since my days as a simple pawnbroker. Back at Baker Street, Holmes, Watson and I sat in the sitting room, savouring our victory. Holmes leaned back in his chair, his eyes twinkling with satisfaction. Another case solved, he said, and another lesson learned. Watson smiled. Indeed, the waiting game can be just as important as the action itself.
I nodded, feeling a deep sense of accomplishment. Thank you both for your guidance and support. I have learned so much from you. Holmes raised his glass in a toast. To teamwork and to the pursuit of justice. We clinked our glasses together, the sound ringing with the promise of future adventures. Though the case of the Royal Treasury was closed, I knew that there would always be new challenges to face and new mysteries to solve. With Holmes and Watson by my side, I felt ready to take on whatever came next. In the days that followed, I continued to work closely with Holmes and Watson. Each new case brought its own unique set of challenges and opportunities for growth. The waiting game had taught me the importance of patience and observation, skills that would serve me well in the future. One afternoon, as we sat in the sitting room reviewing the details of a new case, Holmes turned to me with a thoughtful expression. Mr. Wilson, I have been most impressed with your progress. Your dedication and keen mind have proven invaluable. I felt a swell of pride at his words. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. It has been an honor to learn from you. Holmes smiled. The honor has been mine, Mr. Wilson, and I believe you are ready to take on more responsibility. There is much more to learn, but I have no doubt that you will continue to excel. Watson nodded in agreement. Holmes is right. You have shown great promise, and I look forward to seeing your continued growth. With their encouragement, I felt more determined than ever to pursue my newfound passion. The waiting game had been just one step in my journey a journey that I knew would be filled with many more exciting and challenging adventures. As I looked around the cosy sitting room of 221 B. Baker Street, I felt a deep sense of gratitude for the friendship and mentorship of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Together, we would continue to seek justice and uncover the truth, no matter where the path might lead. Chapter 11. The Capture. The days following the stakeout at the Royal Treasury were filled with a sense of accomplishment and growing camaraderie between Holmes, Watson and me. My confidence as an investigator was steadily increasing under their mentorship. One evening, as we were enjoying a quiet moment at 221 B. Baker Street, a knock on the door interrupted our peace. Mrs. Hudson appeared, announcing the arrival of Inspector Jones. The inspector stepped into the room, his expression serious yet hopeful. Mr. Holmes, we have received a tip about a hidden safe house where the remaining members of the gang are hiding. We need your expertise to capture them. Holmes immediately sprang into action, his eyes gleaming with determination. Inspector, we shall accompany you. Mr. Wilson, Dr. Watson, gather your things. We leave at once. Within minutes, we were on our way, the cab ride filled with a tense anticipation. The location was a rundown building in a less reputable part of London. As we approached, Holmes briefed us on the plan. We must be cautious. These men are desperate and dangerous. Inspector Jones and his officers will surround the building cutting off any escape routes. We will go in through the front, ensuring they have nowhere to run. We arrived at the building, its dilapidated exterior betraying no hint of the danger within. Inspector Jones directed his men into position, their presence a reassuring force in the darkened street. Holmes, Watson and I moved toward the entrance, our steps silent and purposeful. Holmes signalled for us to stop just outside the door. He leaned in, listening intently. After a moment, he nodded, his expression resolute. They are inside. Remember, stay close and be ready for anything. With a swift kick, Holmes forced the door open, and we rushed in. The interior was dimly lit, the shadows concealing the room's occupants. 
As our eyes adjusted to the gloom, we saw several figures huddled around a table, their startled faces turning toward us. Stay where you are, Holmes commanded, his voice ringing with authority. The men sprang to their feet, but it was too late. Inspector Jones and his officers burst in through the other entrances, surrounding them. A fierce struggle ensued. The gang members fought back with the desperation of cornered animals, but they were no match for our combined efforts. Holmes moved with calculated precision, disarming one of the men with a swift motion. Watson and I joined the fray, using our skills to subdue the others. Amidst the chaos, I found myself grappling with a particularly burly thug. His strength was formidable, but my training and determination gave me the edge. I managed to twist his arm behind his back, forcing him to the ground. Well done, Mr. Wilson, Holmes shouted over the din, his eyes never leaving the fight. Keep him there. The battle was intense but brief. One by one, the gang members were restrained and handcuffed. Inspector Jones and his officers moved quickly, securing the room and ensuring that no one could escape. Breathing heavily, we surveyed the scene. The gang members lay subdued, their faces a mixture of anger and defeat. Holmes approached the leader, a man with a scar running down his cheek, and looked him straight in the eye. It's over, Holmes said calmly. Your plans have been thwarted. The man glared at Holmes, his defiance unbroken. This isn't the end, Holmes. There are more of us. You can't stop us all. Holmes's expression remained unflinching. Perhaps not, but we will certainly try. Inspector Jones stepped forward, his handcuffs clicking as he secured the leader. We'll take it from here, Mr. Holmes. You've done more than enough. Holmes nodded, his demeanor composed. Thank you, Inspector. Ensure they are thoroughly questioned. There may be more to uncover. As the police led the gang members away, Holmes, Watson and I took a moment to catch our breath. The adrenaline of the capture still coursed through our veins, but there was also a profound sense of relief and triumph. Another victory, Watson remarked, clapping me on the back. You handled yourself remarkably well, Mr. Wilson. I smiled, feeling both exhausted and exhilarated. Thank you, Dr. Watson. I couldn't have done it without your guidance and support. Holmes turned to me, his expression one of pride and approval. Mr. Wilson, you have proven yourself to be an invaluable asset. Your bravery and quick thinking were instrumental in our success tonight. I felt a deep sense of satisfaction at his words. The journey from pawnbroker to investigator had been unexpected and challenging but moments like this made it all worthwhile. As we made our way back to Baker Street, the night air was cool and refreshing. The streets were quiet, a stark contrast to the turmoil we had just left behind. Holmes walked ahead, his posture relaxed yet alert, always ready for the next challenge. Back at 221 B Baker Street, we settled into our familiar seats, the comfort of the sitting room a welcome reprieve. Holmes poured us each a glass of brandy, raising his in a toast. To justice, he said, his eyes meeting mine, and to the unyielding pursuit of truth. We clinked our glasses together, the sound a harmonious echo of our shared victory. As I sipped the brandy, I felt a deep sense of belonging and purpose. The capture of the gang had solidified my place in this world of intrigue and adventure. In the days that followed, Holmes, Watson and I continued our work, tackling each new case with the same dedication and determination. The lessons I had learned from Holmes were invaluable, and I applied them with growing confidence. 
One evening, as we reviewed our notes on a particularly perplexing case, Holmes turned to me with a thoughtful expression. Mr. Wilson, I believe you have the makings of a great detective. Your instincts and courage have already proven their worth. I felt a surge of pride at his words. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. I have learned so much from you and Dr. Watson. I am grateful for your mentorship. Holmes smiled, his eyes twinkling with approval. The journey is just beginning, Mr. Wilson. There is still much to learn and many more mysteries to solve. With those words, I knew that my path was clear. The capture of the gang was a significant milestone, but it was only the beginning. With Holmes and Watson by my side, I was ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead, confident in our shared pursuit of justice and truth. Chapter 12. The Explanation The day after the dramatic capture of the gang, I found myself once again at 221 B. Baker Street. The morning sun cast a warm glow through the windows, and the familiar surroundings of Holmes's sitting room provided a comforting backdrop as I reflected on the recent events. Holmes, as always, was already busy. He sat in his armchair, a thoughtful expression on his face, while Dr. Watson read through the morning papers. I could see the wheels turning in Holmes's mind as he processed the information we had gathered. Mr. Wilson, Holmes began, breaking the silence, I believe it is time to provide a full explanation of the Red-Headed League and the events that followed. Your involvement in this case has been invaluable and you deserve to understand the complete picture. I leaned forward, eager to hear Holmes's insights. The mysteries surrounding the Red-Headed League had intrigued me from the start, and I was anxious to learn how it all fit together. Holmes took a deep breath and began. The Red-Headed League was, as you now know, a ruse, it was created by John Clay and his accomplices as a means to distract you and keep you out of your shop for several hours each day. The elaborate nature of the scheme was designed to ensure that you would be completely occupied, allowing them to carry out their real plan undisturbed. He paused, giving me a moment to absorb this information. The key to understanding their plot lies in the location of your shop, Mr. Wilson. Positioned next to a bank, your shop provided the perfect cover for their activities. While you were busy copying the Encyclopedia Britannica, they were digging a tunnel from your cellar to the bank vault. I nodded, recalling the strange sounds I had heard from the cellar. And the dissolution of the Red-Headed League was their way of signalling the end of the distraction, correct? Precisely, Holmes replied. Once the tunnel was complete, they no longer needed the Red-Headed League. They dissolved it abruptly, hoping you would not suspect anything amiss. Their timing was crucial, as they planned to execute the heist immediately afterward. Watson chimed in. But thanks to your quick thinking and Mr. Holmes's investigative skills, their plan was thwarted before they could reach the vault. Holmes smiled modestly. It was a team effort indeed. The capture of John Clay and his gang was a significant victory, but there was more to uncover. The notes we found at the abandoned office and the subsequent investigation revealed the extent of their criminal network. I leaned back in my chair taking it all in. So, the Red-Headed League was just one part of a larger operation. Exactly, Holmes confirmed. John Clay and his associates were involved in numerous schemes across London. The Red-Headed League was one of their more elaborate distractions, but it was only the tip of the iceberg. By dismantling their network, we have not only prevented a major robbery, but also disrupted their other criminal activities. Feeling a sense of closure, I asked, And what will happen to John Clay and his gang now? 
Inspector Jones and the police will see to it that they are brought to justice, Holmes assured me. They will face trial for their crimes, and with the evidence we have gathered, there is no doubt they will be convicted. Watson nodded. It's a fitting end for such a cunning group of criminals. Thanks to your bravery and persistence, Mr. Wilson, we were able to stop them. I felt a swell of pride and gratitude. Thank you both. I couldn't have done it without your guidance and support. Holmes leaned forward, his expression serious yet kind. Mr. Wilson, you have proven yourself to be a capable and courageous investigator. The lessons you have learned from this case will serve you well in the future. Remember always to trust your instincts and question anything that seems out of place. I nodded, feeling a deep sense of resolve. The adventure of the Red-Headed League had been a transformative experience, one that had awakened a new sense of purpose within me. I knew that my journey as an investigator was just beginning. As the days turned into weeks, life at the pawn shop returned to its usual rhythm. However, my newfound skills and insights continued to shape my daily activities. I paid closer attention to details, observed my surroundings with a keener eye, and remained vigilant for anything unusual. One evening, as I was closing up the shop, a young woman entered, looking distraught. Mr. Wilson, she said, her voice trembling, I need your help. I ushered her inside, offering her a seat. What seems to be the problem, miss? She explained that she had recently inherited a small estate from her late uncle. But strange occurrences had been happening since then. Unexplained noises, missing items, and a general sense of unease had made her fearful. Recalling Holmes's advice to trust my instincts, I decided to investigate. I visited her estate the next day, carefully examining the property and speaking with the staff. It didn't take long to uncover the source of the disturbances. A disgruntled former employee who had been trying to scare her into selling the property at a low price. With this information, I was able to help her resolve the issue and restore peace to her home. The gratitude in her eyes and the sense of accomplishment I felt reinforced my decision to pursue a career in investigation. I continued to study under Holmes, assisting him with various cases and learning from his vast knowledge and experience. Each new challenge honed my skills and deepened my understanding of the intricate world of detection. One afternoon, as we sat in the cosy sitting room of 221 B Baker Street, Holmes turned to me with a thoughtful expression. Mr. Wilson, you have come a long way since the days of the Red-Headed League. Your growth as an investigator has been remarkable. I smiled, feeling a deep sense of gratitude. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Your mentorship has been invaluable. Holmes nodded, his eyes twinkling with approval. The journey is ongoing, Mr. Wilson. There is always more to learn and many more mysteries to solve. But I have no doubt that you will continue to excel. With those words, I knew that my path was clear. The Red-Headed League had been a turning point in my life, leading me to discover my true calling. With Holmes and Watson by my side, I felt ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead, confident in our shared pursuit of justice and truth. Chapter 13. The Mastermind The following weeks were a whirlwind of activity. The successful capture of John Clay and his gang had bolstered my confidence as an investigator, and I continued to work closely with Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson on a variety of cases. Each new challenge sharpened my skills and deepened my understanding of the world of crime and detection. One afternoon, as I was sorting through some documents at my pawn shop, a letter arrived for me. The envelope was plain, 
but the handwriting was elegant and precise. I opened it to find a message from Inspector Jones. Mr. Wilson, your presence is requested at Scotland Yard. We have apprehended a suspect who claims to have information about the Red-Headed League. Please come at your earliest convenience. Inspector Jones. I felt a surge of curiosity and excitement. Who could this suspect be, and what new information might they have? I quickly closed up the shop and made my way to Scotland Yard. Upon my arrival, Inspector Jones greeted me and led me to an interrogation room. Inside, a man sat at a table, his hands cuffed. He was thin and pale, with sharp features and a shifty look in his eyes. Jones introduced him as Arthur Blackwood, a known associate of John Clay. Mr. Blackwood has agreed to cooperate, Jones explained. He claims to know the identity of the mastermind behind the Red-Headed League. My heart quickened at the prospect of uncovering the true architect of the scheme. I took a seat opposite Blackwood and listened as he began to speak. Mr. Wilson, Blackwood said, his voice trembling slightly. I don't want to go to prison. I'll tell you everything I know if it helps me get a lighter sentence. I nodded, encouraging him to continue. Tell us what you know, Mr. Blackwood. Who is behind the Red-Headed League? Blackwood glanced nervously at Jones before speaking. The mastermind is a man named Sebastian Moran. He's a criminal genius, always one step ahead of the law. He came up with the idea for the Red-Headed League to fund his other operations. The name Sebastian Moran sent a chill down my spine. I had heard of him before. He was notorious in the criminal underworld, known for his cunning and ruthlessness. Holmes had mentioned him once, describing him as a dangerous adversary. Where can we find Moran? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. Blackwood hesitated before answering. He has a safe house in the East End, hidden in the basement of an old warehouse. But be careful. He's heavily guarded and extremely dangerous. Inspector Jones thanked Blackwood for the information and then turned to me. We need to act quickly, Mr. Wilson. Will you accompany us to the safe house? I agreed without hesitation, eager to bring Moran to justice. We left Scotland Yard and headed to the East End, accompanied by a contingent of police officers. As we approached the warehouse, the tension was palpable. Holmes's words echoed in my mind. Always trust your instincts and be prepared for anything. The warehouse was a grim, imposing structure, its windows boarded up and its exterior covered in grime. Inspector Jones directed his men to surround the building, cutting off any potential escape routes. We approached the entrance cautiously, ready for whatever awaited us inside. With a signal from Jones, the officers forced the door open and we rushed in. The interior was dimly lit, the air thick with dust. We moved quietly, our eyes scanning the shadows for any sign of movement. Suddenly, a figure darted out from behind a stack of crates, firing a gun. The shot missed us by inches, and the police returned fire, quickly subduing the attacker. We pressed on, determined to find Moran. In the back of the warehouse, we discovered a staircase leading down to the basement. We descended slowly, our footsteps echoing in the confined space. At the bottom, we found a heavy door, reinforced with iron bars. Jones signalled for the officers to prepare for a breach. With a loud crash, the door was forced open and we stormed into the basement. The room was filled with crates and barrels, and in the centre stood Sebastian Moran, a look of cold defiance on his face. He raised his hands in mock surrender, a sly smile playing on his lips. Well, well, Moran said, 
his voice dripping with sarcasm. If it isn't the famous Sherlock Holmes protégé and the ever-persistent Inspector Jones, what an honour. Ignoring his taunts, Jones stepped forward. Sebastian Moran, you are under arrest for your involvement in the Red-Headed League and numerous other crimes. Surrender now or face the consequences. Moran's smile faded and his eyes hardened. You think you've won? This is far from over. Before he could react, the police officers moved in, restraining him and securing the room. As they led Moran away, I felt a sense of triumph and relief. The mastermind behind the Red-Headed League was finally captured. Back at Scotland Yard, Inspector Jones and I debriefed Holmes on the operation. Holmes listened intently, his expression serious. When we finished, he leaned back in his chair, a thoughtful look in his eyes. Sebastian Moran is a formidable adversary, Holmes said. But thanks to your bravery and quick thinking, Mr. Wilson, we have dealt a significant blow to his criminal empire. I felt a swell of pride at his words. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. It was a team effort. Holmes nodded, his eyes twinkling with approval. Indeed. But remember, Moran is cunning and resourceful. This may not be the last we hear of him. As I left Baker Street that evening, I reflected on the journey that had brought me here. The adventure of the Red-Headed League had been a transformative experience, one that had tested my resolve and sharpened my skills. With Holmes and Watson by my side, I felt ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead, confident in our shared pursuit of justice and truth. The capture of Sebastian Moran marked the end of one chapter and the beginning of another. I knew that the path of an investigator was fraught with danger and uncertainty, but it was a path I was eager to follow. With each new case, I would continue to learn and grow, driven by the desire to uncover the truth and bring criminals to justice. As I walked through the streets of London, the city bustling with life and activity, I felt a renewed sense of purpose. The journey ahead was sure to be filled with twists and turns, but I was ready to face it with courage and determination. The adventure of the Red-Headed League had taught me that with perseverance and the right allies, anything was possible. Chapter 14. The Aftermath With the capture of Sebastian Moran, the mastermind behind the Red-Headed League, a significant chapter in my life came to a close. The experience had been intense and enlightening, and I knew it had forever changed me. The immediate aftermath of Moran's capture was a whirlwind of activity and reflection. The day after Moran's arrest, I returned to my pawn shop, feeling a mixture of relief and pride. The shop, with its familiar sights and sounds, provided a sense of normalcy amidst the excitement of the previous weeks. As I organized the items on the shelves, my mind wandered back to the investigation and the many lessons I had learned from Holmes and Watson. Just as I was beginning to settle into my routine, a customer entered the shop. To my surprise, it was Mr. Merriweather, the bank manager whose vault had nearly been robbed by Moran's gang. He greeted me warmly, his eyes twinkling with gratitude. Mr. Wilson, he said, shaking my hand firmly. I wanted to personally thank you for your role in capturing Sebastian Moran. Your bravery and determination have made a significant impact. I felt a swell of pride at his words. Thank you, Mr. Merriweather. It was an honor to assist in bringing him to justice. He smiled. The entire banking community is grateful for your efforts. Please know that you have our support in any future endeavours. As Mr. Merriweather left the shop, I couldn't help but feel a deep sense of fulfilment. The recognition and appreciation from those I had helped reinforced my decision to pursue a career in investigation. 
Later that afternoon, I received a visit from Inspector Jones. He had come to share some important updates about the case and to discuss the next steps in our efforts to dismantle Moran's criminal network. Mr. Wilson, Jones began, thanks to your invaluable assistance, we have uncovered more information about Moran's operations. We are now working to apprehend his remaining associates and put an end to their activities. I nodded, eager to continue the fight against crime. What can I do to help, Inspector? Jones smiled, his eyes reflecting a sense of camaraderie. Your insights and knowledge have been crucial thus far. We would like you to assist us in interrogating some of the captured gang members. They may reveal additional information that can lead us to the remaining fugitives. I agreed without hesitation, ready to take on the new challenge. The interrogation sessions were intense, but they provided valuable insights into the workings of Moran's network. Each piece of information brought us closer to dismantling the entire operation. During this time, I continued to work closely with Holmes and Watson. Our bond grew stronger as we tackled each new case with determination and skill. Holmes's mentorship had become an integral part of my life and I was grateful for the opportunity to learn from one of the greatest minds in the field. One evening, as we sat in the familiar surroundings of 221 B Baker Street, Holmes shared his thoughts on the aftermath of the case. Mr. Wilson, he began, the capture of Sebastian Moran was a significant victory, but our work is far from over. Criminals like Moran often have far-reaching networks, and it is our duty to ensure that justice is served. I nodded, understanding the gravity of his words. I am ready to continue the fight, Mr. Holmes, whatever it takes to bring them to justice. Holmes smiled, his eyes reflecting a sense of pride. Your dedication and courage are commendable, Mr. Wilson. Together we will make a difference. As the weeks turned into months, we continued to uncover and dismantle the remnants of Moran's network. Each success brought us closer to our goal of ensuring the safety and security of the community. Throughout this journey, I found myself growing not only as an investigator, but also as an individual. The challenges we faced and the victories we achieved shaped me in ways I had never imagined. I became more confident, more observant, and more determined to uphold the principles of justice. One particular case during this period stands out in my memory. We had received information about a hidden stash of stolen goods linked to Moran's gang. The location was a decrepit warehouse on the outskirts of the city, similar to the one where we had captured Moran. Holmes, Watson and I, along with Inspector Jones and his officers, prepared for the raid. The air was thick with tension as we approached the building. Holmes reminded us of the importance of vigilance and caution. As we entered the warehouse, we found ourselves in a labyrinth of crates and barrels. The dim lighting and the musty smell created an eerie atmosphere. We moved silently our senses heightened. Suddenly, we heard a noise from one of the back rooms. Holmes signalled for us to stop, his eyes narrowing as he listened intently. With a swift motion, he led us toward the source of the sound. In the room, we found several men hurriedly packing stolen goods into crates. They were caught off guard by our sudden appearance. Holmes stepped forward, his voice calm but commanding. Drop everything and surrender, he said. You are surrounded. The men hesitated, but seeing the determined faces of the police officers, they complied. The stolen goods were recovered and the criminals were apprehended without further incident. As we stood amidst the recovered items, I couldn't help but feel a deep sense of accomplishment. The raid had been a success and we had taken another step toward dismantling Moran's network. 
Back at Baker Street, Holmes, Watson and I reflected on the day's events. Holmes's expression was one of satisfaction and contemplation. Today was another victory for justice, he said. But remember, the fight against crime is ongoing. We must remain vigilant and relentless in our pursuit. I nodded, feeling a renewed sense of purpose. I understand, Mr. Holmes. I am committed to this cause, and I will continue to do everything in my power to help. Holmes smiled, his eyes reflecting a deep sense of camaraderie. I have no doubt, Mr. Wilson. You have proven yourself time and again. Together, we will continue to make a difference. As I left Baker Street that evening, I felt a profound sense of fulfillment and determination. The aftermath of the Red-Headed League and the capture of Sebastian Moran had solidified my place in this world of investigation and justice. The journey ahead was sure to be filled with challenges and dangers, but I knew that with Holmes and Watson by my side, we would face them with courage and resolve. The fight against crime was far from over, but it was a fight I was ready to continue, driven by the desire to uncover the truth and uphold the principles of justice.